So 2007, you became not just an artist, you became an escape artist. You escaped from prison. Uh, no, James, I absconded. Absconded. Escape sounds better. What, well, I, I, had to, I had to climb a really big fence. <laughs> how does that, yeah. how, so what was going through your mind then? Did you not have any release date or did you think, fuck this, this is my opportunity, I'm going to take it? Because you ended up on an aeroplane also, I believe. Yeah, Tell me the story. Light, I, I hope there's not much. I, I, I hope I won't have any, uh, face any consequences for this. You ever yeah. with Charlie Bronson? Yeah, I was with Charlie Bronson up in Franklin's prison. I was next door to him in a segregation unit. And I was next door to him in, um, sorry, I was with him in Winston Green. Who was he? Prison. Charlie Bronson, I think, is an absolutely adorable person. Um, he was he was a, always a gentleman to me. He was always extremely kind. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't have the best press in the world. I don't think people realise actually what you went through in prison, especially struggling with... Mm -hmm being openly trans and the beatings that you got the slashings the rapings there's even pool cues stuck in, stuck in you as well um, how many people would abuse you gang rape how many people were involved well this this not so I was because I did I did learn to defend myself mm -hmm. but it still wouldn't stop on on at least a monthly basis, sometimes on a weekly basis, where people would spit at you. Um, people would just openly uh, mock you, get in your, um, get in your way, stop, stop you walking down their landing, um, chuck um, cups of urine in my face, cups of piss in my face. Um, they'd put, um, they'd, they'd put shit in my bed or under my pillow. Uh, they'd go in my cell and piss all over my bed, uh, throw stuff on my photographs. I mean, some of the best sex that I have <laughs> ever had has been in prison. <laughs> Maybe that's how you Maybe don't want to leave. Maybe that's because I spent most of my life behind bars, James. <laughs> I would get gay men, straight men, mm -hmm. uh, male prison staff, female prison staff come on to me all the time. No way. Yeah, James. Fucking hell. Because I represented some, I think I represented something mm -hmm. to them that they had not seen before. Yeah. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got the lovely Sarah Jane Baker. How are you? It's an absolute pleasure to be with you today, James. Yes, likewise. I have long been an admirer and... Um, <laughs> Um, thank you very much for this yes. opportunity to well, talk to you mm -hmm. and um, to talk to your um, and to address your fantastic viewers. Yeah, it's amazing to have you. You've got a very interesting story. The longest serving transgender in the world, over 30 years spent in prison. You're out now 150, 115 days, sorry. 115 days, How James. are you feeling? Well, it's, um, it's been an interesting journey. Um, which is how I like to describe uh, my life and my experiences since release. There's been lots of downs. There have been lots of times where I did wish that I was back in prison. Um, I think prison is cruel. And I think release after 30 years of prison is a different kind of cruelty if you're not getting enough support from, from the system. Yeah, you've not had the easiest of lives either. You were abused as a kid. You've been gang raped in prison. So to still be sitting here, everything that you've went through, which we'll touch on, and to be working with a lot of amazing organisations to help people, vulnerable people also, and create a name. You're also fighting to be a politician, to sit at the big table and make the right decisions for people. We spoke earlier, and what you're trying to achieve is, is second to none, and I'm proud of you for doing that and trying to make those sacrifices. We'll go right back to the start, though, Sarah, and um, kind of where you grew up and how your life began, how it all planned out from then. Um, I was born in, <coughs> bless you, I was born in South London. Um, I was raised by a, a father who was um, extremely violent. He loved beating his wives. He loved beating his children. He thought that was his right. 
Um, now he's older, he, has, uh, he will take no responsibility for uh, the consequences of his actions. The consequences being that what he did damaged many people, including myself. However, as an adult, I have to take responsibility for my own actions now and stop using my father's abuse as an excuse. Well, um, eventually I ended up in the care system, the youth custody system, and the prison system, as you, uh, as you know, James. Uh, what ages did you start getting into trouble? I think I started getting into trouble when I was perhaps nine years of age. Um, I just started running away from home. I was a bedwetter. And every time I wet the bed, my stepmother would encourage my father to beat me uh, or to take uh, or make me sleep in the toilet in our house. So I'd, I would have to take my mattress from my bed into the toilet and sleep on the toilet floor. If my, dad, if my father had guests come round, they would have to stand over me to use the toilet. He, I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. And I was ashamed of, um, I was ashamed of even being alive. And that's not a good feeling to have when you're a child. Um, in the end, I started running away, um, living on the streets of London. Um, I mean, it's no secret to anybody who knows me that I was a sex worker then, or a rent boy, as we were called, um, I was naive. I kind of believed that the lust that some of these men and some women had for me, I mistook it for, for love. Um, at least someone wanted me and wasn't beating me, wasn't punching me, and um, wasn't humiliating me. Yeah, was that just craving that kind of attention, some sort of love that you were getting accepted for what you were doing and you weren't getting beaten, you weren't getting made to feel like shit. People were, obviously they were paying you for your work, but you were getting attention where it felt you probably never had before. Well, James, all I can say is, all I wanted is what you wanted and what your viewers want, and that's to be loved. Mm -hmm. That's That was all I wanted. It was There was nothing complicated about it. Um, I had no desire for riches. Um, I had no desire for, I don't know, a, lots of money. I just wanted people to love me, for me to accept me as me, um, and not to have um, my father, who's my primary carer, treat me like I was a punch bag. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a child and he was an adult and I wasn't the only victim of his cruelty. My father, as I did in later years, has left a trail of destruction behind him that he will not acknowledge. Yeah, that would be difficult to repair mm. as well. You were a family of 12? Yeah, there's lots of us. Yeah, so there was a load. Yeah. yeah. Were you all on the same roof? No. Um, Under the same roof? No, he wasn't. Um, my father had five partners and children to each of us, uh, yeah. each of them. them Did uh, everyone get abused? James, um, it's not really my nature to be evasive, but these, yeah. these, these of my, um, these are my direct family, and. Um, of course, I will answer any question you've got to ask about me, yeah, but I have yeah. to be sensitive to um, other people's to, yeah, to, yeah, to, to, their, to their feelings. Yeah. And um, I mean, some of my family, uh, some of their children may may not know about their past, and it wouldn't be yeah, okay. it, it, it wouldn't it yeah, wouldn't yeah, be yeah. the dumb thing, you know. Totally understand. Okay. So when you started doing the sex work, how old were you? Probably about twelve years of age. So a lot of paedophilia then with for men and women. For you, at certain well, ages. the world then, back in the mid nineteen eighties, was a different world. Um, I still remember the days 
Well, I still remember them days where um, it wasn't long before that that you had the sign saying no blacks, no dogs, no gypsies. You know, this is the this was a time of people um, of white. English people watching programs like uh, Till Death to Us Part, watching Alf Garnet, this acceptable face of, of racism. Um, not just racism, these were the days, uh, James, before the law changed to say that, um, um, that raping your wife was a crime. At this time, it wasn't. I mean, if, if some man decided that he wanted to beat his wife after death, the police wouldn't even get involved. It was called a domestic. Um, I'm sure it's the same up in, in your part yeah, of uh, the UK. Yeah. But um, even cases of child sex abuse. I mean, I knew lots of children who were being abused by their own parents. Um, and it was common knowledge and nobody, nobody kind of blinked an eyelid. It was um, it was a different time. This was also a time where if you was gay, if you was transgender, people would feel quite comfortable in beating you up. You know, when people used to go up the West End to go queer bashing, it wasn't something that they actually felt ashamed about. They'd they'd be quite proud of that. I mean, I've. It was a really. It was. It was a different time. This was the days of Benny Hill. This was the times of, um, to I mean, uh, grown men on television um, blacking up. I mean, for for our entertainment. Uh, also, a time of Benny Hill chasing uh, chasing schoolgirls around the field, you know, and it was this acceptable. It was a really uncomfortable mm-hmm. um, time, yeah, and a really uncomfortable period uh, of time in in British in British history and um, <laughs> the entertainment history too. Yeah, you you always say I've read a few of your interviews. You've also released two books. You were a uh, woman trapped in a man's body. When yeah. did you start getting those feelings? Did you always? When did you start experimenting, or did you always know that? who you wanted to be or who you wanted to identify with or were you too scared because obviously the 80s was a tough time for anyone to say they were gay or whatever because obviously the beatings people getting murdered it wasn't accepted as the way things are now where it's it's a, I believe it's open for everyone mm. I believe if you want to be who you are as long as you're not hurting anyone then so be it but, absolutely but, James but then for you how was that how, what ages did you start feeling you didn't know who you were or what you wanted to do or who you wanted to become? Well, for as long as I remember, I always felt that um, that my body didn't match my mind or my mindset. I always believed that I was that I was a girl and eventually a woman trapped in a man's body. Now, when I was younger, I I couldn't really. I didn't really have anybody that I could talk to about these feelings that I had. So, I mean, my family, uh, I think uh, one judge described my family as being feral. Um, I mean, my father's is a racist. I believe he hates women. I believe he's homophobic. Every... I believe he's transphobic too. He's, my father's not the kind of person I could talk to. Um, my own mother um, uh, ran away from, from the family house, leaving me and two brothers behind because my dad used to beat her all the time. And the only memories I had of her is if with black eyes. So I never really had anyone that I could talk to about his really deep feelings. And of course... By the time I started to um, really acknowledge um, the gender dysphoria, how uncomfortable I felt within my own skin, I was a teenager. And at that time, um, the fact that AIDS existed, uh, it was all over the press, James. Remember yourself, as soon as you turned on the television, it was like AIDS. Mm -hmm. And everyone thought they were going to die just from sharing a cup. Which I mean, or sitting on a toilet that someone else had sat on. This was a time of demonising 
the other. This was a time of demonizing people who who didn't conform. Um, it was a really, it was yeah, a really strange I time. Remember Freddie Mercury in the eighties? The kind of he was like the the man. It was it was all over with him because obviously mm. all over the press because obviously his celebrity status that and a lot. Of, I was only a kid, but a lot of people were scared. A lot of people spoke about it. This might sound silly, but everything that you see about your dad, all that anger and frustration. Because I watched a documentary on Netflix just a couple of days ago called The Making of Aaron Hernandez. This was a NFL player, a big, strong lad. Mm -hmm. His dad used to beat him. But there was a lot... He, he did a lot of murders. But because they're saying that because of his sexuality, he was gay, but he tried to pretend this big, strong image. Mm -hmm. Do you ever think that potentially your dad might have had the same feelings you did and his way of trying to deflect it was by anger and frustration and trying to beat everyone? I will, <clears throat> I will on this occasion, James, be charitable mm -hmm. and um, say that there may be something in what you're saying. I'm not a religious person. Very far from it. Many churches would not let me through their door. But I believe that, um, <clears throat> that it's a good thing to express some kind of remorse to help people have some kind of closure and and that if you have done bad things and if you have, if you have hurt people it it's it's a courageous thing to go and try and repair some of the damage that you've done my father is not a person to do that um is he still alive yeah my father is still alive when was the last time you seen him? I saw the last time I saw my father was when I escaped from prison in two thousand and seven. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm free now legally yeah. <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> Thank you. Do you? It's such a hard question for people, especially the, the abuse that you got from your father. But to, I believe to move on, there's got to be some sort of forgiveness. Did you? Would you? Do you forgive him, or do you accept what he'd done? And maybe he's fighting with his own demons. Or maybe, was he abused or anything when he was a kid? Do you My know? My father was not the kind of person to share that kind yeah, of information. So um, I don't know what kind of childhood my father had. But you know, James, I've met many damaged people, as you know, as you have too. Yeah. Not everybody who is damaged goes on to damage others. Mm -hmm. They say there's this circle abuse in um, some psychologists I've met on my travels. They say there's this circle abuse. People who were abused, there's more chance of those abusing others. And that is probably true, but it's not true in all cases. Whatever my father may or may not have gone through as a child, I'll I feel for him. But that's no excuse to. It's, that, it's no excuse to like to do the same thing to to children. And my father was a grown man. We were children. Mm -hmm. We weren't we weren't adults uh, having a punch up in a local boozer. We we were we were children, James. Yeah. And pardon my language, it's not very ladylike, but it's fucking wrong. Yeah. Totally. Totally. So, I mean, totally for a grown agree, adult yeah. to 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 use implements, use sticks, and or or to punch children with the same force as if he was punching an adult, mm -hmm. that's wrong. Now that may say a lot about his childhood, but to be blunt, I couldn't give a fuck. Yeah. You don't. I find I find I, I hate violence I will do everything I can to avoid it which is strange because I was really good at it <laughs> you know James <laughs> clearly because you spent over 30 years in the jail for violence yeah. We'll touch on that then so when was the first time you went to because you were in the Young Offenders as well yeah I what first, age 
Um, I was 15 when I went to Latchmere House, um, which was then a youth custody centre. Yeah. Um, what was that for? Uh, stealing bicycles. Yeah. Ste- stealing BMX bikes. I was living on the streets. You're homeless? Yeah, I was, yeah, I was homeless. Um, but the thing is, there, there were um, opportunities for me to get off the street. The probation service had offered me opportunities, but I didn't trust any adults. I didn't trust anyone in authority. And personally, I'd rather sleep in a sleeping bag um, under the embankment or the Waterloo Ball Ring or indeed, God bless them, uh, Centre Point, mm-hmm. the Centre Point Homeless Shelter, which um, I think may still be on Shaftesbury Avenue. Mm-hmm. They, look, they looked after me really well. How was, your, how was it in the Young Offenders then? Because I believe the Young Offenders Institute is worse than the adult one because people are trying to make a name for themselves. People are, are seem a lot more angrier. Um, how were you getting treated then? Were you good at covering up how you were feeling or how you were thinking? Well, it was really difficult because in um, in a youth custody centre, you know, the, um, the most common um, the most common way of spending your time is talking bollocks about each other, stabbing each other in the back. And a lot of people in the youth custody centre knew me from children's homes. Um, you know, you could have you could have written V on my head for victim when I went in. I was small. Um, I had national wealth glasses with a bit of sellotape around them. Um, I was a target for anyone who wanted to let their anger out on anybody. Um, um, anyone who wanted to rob my canteen from the prison shop. You know, it was um, it was a it was a Youth custody mm. was bad, and obviously with my history of um, self harm, um, it that really didn't help. Yeah. So you, from the get go of your life, when you're born, you've been a victim and bullied and battered. What age were you when you says, "Fuck this, no more," and then you just started sticking up for yourself? And is this where the anger came from? Because you're just sick of taking the shit that you took. There are parts of my life that I am still ashamed of. Um, of course, I went to prison for seven years for kidnapping, aggravated burglary, unlawful imprisonment, and GBH with intent of my stepmother's brother. Brother. And I deserved everything I got. The victim in no way deserved the pain that he was put through. Um, legally, it wouldn't be right for me to 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 dis to discuss that, and also I wouldn't want to bring any kind of distress to the victim or his family. But um, once I got that seven year sentence. Which I deserved. I I I deserved to do thirty years just for the pain that I I put this person through. I realised in prison that it's um it's a brutal, it's a brutal place to be, and you've got to be brutal to survive. If people are not afraid of you, you will be a victim, and you will get fucked up, mm-hmm. mentally and physically. When you got your seven and a half, that was for the kidnap of the mother-in-law's my, my stepmother's brother, brother. Yeah. stepmother's brother. You got a seven and a half, but you never, you end up doing an attempt murder in prison, and that's yeah. where you done your thirty years. Why? Why was the attempt murder? Um, well, when I went into prison on, I say on numerous occasions, um, people who knew that I identified as transgender thought they could. Um, they thought they could slash me with razor blades. They thought they could stab me. And they thought they could rape me. And and they could because they did. So um, these are things that didn't even come out in court because I was so ashamed. And I was too embarrassed. And I didn't want people to think that I was a weak person 
and so when I tried to take um, my revenge on one of the people who hurt me um, um, and 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 thank God he, d- he, he didn't die he didn't even go to the prison hospital but I'm sure mentally um, he was I had damaged him um, I was charged with attempted murder because because I tried to kill him for I'm not here to promote violence but f- for a man who was raping you and slashing you I believe that anyone not anyone but I believe you've got a right to defend yourself and because it's killed or be killed and these people were there to torment you torture you so for sticking up for yourself then fair play because I think people would understand that because I don't think people realise actually what you went through in prison especially struggling with mm-hmm. being openly trans and the beatings that you got the slashings the rapings there's even pill cues stuck in, stuck in you as well um, how many people would abuse you gang rape how many people were involved well this this not so I was because I did I did learn to defend myself mm-hmm. but it still wouldn't stop on on at least a monthly basis sometimes on a weekly basis where people would spit at you um People will just openly uh, mock you, get in your um, get in your way, stop stop you walking down their landing, um, chuck um, cups of urine in my face, cups of piss in my face. Um, they'd put um, they'd they'd put shit in my bed or under my pillow. Uh, they'd go in my cell and piss all over my bed, uh, throw stuff on my photographs. It was, um, I think, revealing that I was transgender in prison was maybe not the smartest thing I've ever done, James. Yeah, but fair play for doing it because I think the British, the prison system say there's only a hundred, over 100 people who say they're transgender, but you're saying it's close to 2,000 people. They're just yeah. too scared to come forward. But you can't really blame them because the stuff you went through, mm. it's fucking scary. And for you to do that, it takes a lot of courage. Things it's James, it's not just about um people not having the courage to uh to 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 live in their gender they identify with in prison. Um it's not just about the fear of other prisoners, it's the fear of their own families too. Um Coming out as transgender to your family can be a devast- can have a devastating impact on your family, especially if uh, the person has children, as as a wife, um, perhaps as parents who who are transphobic. Anyone who's anyone who's brave enough and strong enough to come out as as trans, um, sometimes they have to be willing to sacrifice all the people they love because all the people they love may sacrifice them. Yeah, but if people disown you for being different sexuality or trans or whatever it is, then so be it because that's not really family then or friends who turn their back and walk away, especially at a vulnerable time when you're being open and honest. So for me, for anybody that's maybe struggling to come out and you do, then fuck them, the ones who do turn their back because then they don't deserve, I believe, to be in your company no matter what it is you want to do in life. But James, we often make compromises in life and um, we often love and care about people whose views we may not necessarily agree with, Mm -hmm. you know. um, It may not be that the family or parents are transphobic. It may be the way that our society is structured. And the amount of people in this country who care more about what the neighbours think, what will the neighbours think about them, than thinking about their own flesh and blood. Did you have a relationship inside any long 
term relationships you, sexual relationships pleasant, yeah. yeah of, co- of course forced on. yeah of, co- of, of course yeah. james um i th- sex i i'm I mean, maybe um, maybe a, a psychologist uh, amongst your viewers will maybe correct me. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know, um, <laughs> sex ranks highly on there. And and what what, <laughs> what, do, what do people think that human beings just because they go to jail they lose their sexual desire? <laughs> to me, James, a different is, man. Want breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> <laughs> to me, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and getting your leg over. Why would that stop just because you're behind bars, yeah. James? No, but that's what, did you have a, like a serious relationship with someone? I've, I've had um, many sexual relationships mm-hmm. in, in prison mm-hmm. with some absolutely fantastic people, James. Yeah. Um, I'll say, I love sex. Shagging. <laughs> James, are you flirting with me, babes? Always, Sarah, always. <laughs> James, I, 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 would, it, would it make I mean, some of the best sex that I have ever had has been in prison. <laughs> Maybe that's how you do it. Maybe that's because I spent most of my life behind bars, James. But you know, I, I, I like sex probably as well as 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 much as any yeah. as much so as sexually the, active as, then, as yeah. much as the next person. Did you have any that we are involved with? Men who were saying they were straight, who would just come with you, but keep it a secret kind of thing. James, I can turn a straight man um, <laughs> in a heartbeat. She's been working on me for the last two weeks, but we'll see. That's stuff. because you're so gorgeous, James. <laughs> You've only got standards, babe. <laughs> so, sexual active in prison, standard. S- s- yeah, I've. Um, it was. Uh, I recently wrote uh, a piece. Uh, hopefully it's going to be published by a uh, vice magazine mm-hmm. um, about sex in male prisons. Um, I wrote the piece once and then I went away and I thought, you know what? The public deserve the truth. And the truth is that whatever goes on outside of prison also goes on inside Mm -hmm. now i'm not talking about um like a a saturday night spit roasts after 25 (laughs) stellas but you know um Stuck for words there, sir. That's Prisoners the, that's can the be first, dirty bastards, James. <laughs> that's the first time Do she's I mean? been stuck for words. And I'd, and I would get I would get gay men, straight men, mm-hmm. uh, male prison staff, female prison staff come on to me all the time. No way. Yeah, James. Fucking hell. Because I represented something. I think I represented something mm-hmm. to them that they had not seen before. Yeah. So that would have been a turn on for them. James, look at me. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm no Paris Lees or India Willoughby because I can't afford 30 grand's mm-hmm. worth of face shaping. Not yet. But, you know, mm-hmm. I'm authentic, James. Yeah. You know, and 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 I and on the whole, I love people. My childhood hasn't stopped me caring about other people. Mm-hmm. And, um, so, I mean, I... Yeah. Listen, prison wasn't all bad it was perhaps 99 percent fucking awful <laughs> but that other one percent mm-hmm. was fantastic I met, I met some <laughs> <laughs> how, how did they the because you were in category yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck for words James. Yeah, you've, first, you've, you've taken a, my that, breath away that, well, you're sitting across from me i'm gonna have to punish you afterwards <laughs> james you do know that we'll keep the cameras rolling for okay. that don't worry i'll get the numbers up so how did you get treated by the category A? Because you were in with the, the most fearsome and dangerous men in the world, basically, in the prison. How how did they treat you well? Because you're known well, as... Well, I think it was the... Sc- the trans mafia? The trans... The, the, what the is it? trans mafia. No, it was... They, I was called a trans gangster. A trans gangster? By a prison governor who mm-hmm. discovered that I was a, a mobile phone and, and drug dealer. Yeah, because you were not... Able, yeah, you had... Because you believed if you controlled the drugs, the phones, then you control the wing. So then you, you, you and whoever controls the wing will be whoever controls the, um, especially mobile phones. Mm-hmm. Because currently the phone I have at the moment, which is perhaps was it, hundred pounds, 
in prison, this is this is a thousand pound. Yeah. You know? And um if you can supply prisoners with what they need, they will protect you. They won't care what you're wearing. And James, you know, people can say what they want about why people are in jail. I've seen I've seen um I've seen prisoners in jail who have been in for multiple rapes get stabbed, cut and burnt and no one would talk to them. Yet I've seen prisoners in jail who've been in for multiple rapes and because they bring drugs into the jail, I mean, mm -hmm. even, some of them, even some of the biggest villains that both you and I know would deal with them. You understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. That 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 hypocrisy of it. They're like, yeah, as long as you can bring, as long as as long as you can get drugs. Oh, you're, you you might you might be a serial rapist, but but we'll have it. Do you know what I mean? But if you're yeah. poor, do you know what I mean? If you've got no access to nothing, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you're in for these deviant crimes, you will get your life will be murder. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 just a double standards. Yeah. So you found a you way know? to get protection. We are. And get. of course, I did all the maximum security prisons, yeah. as you know. Who were you in with? Um, IRA, UDA, UDF, PLO, mm -hmm. PLA. By the time I started moving through the system, that's when a lot of people, um, um, where you would have like Muslim extremists, would come in. And by by then, I'd left the, uh, the maximum security prison mm -hmm. system. You ever yeah. with Charlie Bronson? Yeah, I was with Charlie Bronson up in Franklin's prison. I was next door to him in a segregation unit and I was next door to him in, um, sorry, I was with him in Winston Green. Who was he? Prison. Charlie Bronson, I think he's an absolutely adorable person. Um, he was, he was a, always a gentleman to me. He was always extremely kind. Um Unfortunately, he doesn't have the best press in the world, um, but he was always a gentleman to me, and uh, a gentleman. And he was, I'll say, he was to me. I thought he was a bit of a lovable rogue. Yeah, because I think he's, bit of a rough diamond. Yeah, you know? he spent over forty years. He's never did a murder. He's just a constant brand. I think it's the press that maybe keep him in. But I think he's trying to change that now. I think he's got a good team behind him. Because I was speaking to Vic Dart, and he says he's they're trying to get the team behind them where they're not trying to portray that image because all the mm. books and films it's all violence they're trying to change that to hopefully get them out but of course there. um charlie charlie's big enough to take this but um some of his artwork could be considered homophobic and um i think this is why he received his last sentence because um an art teacher um called Charlie out on that. Charlie went to the art teacher and said, what do you think of my art? And the teacher, I believe, was gay. Um, wasn't too favourable in his comments to our Charlie. And, you know, Charlie kicked off. Mm -hmm. And now he's got the sentence he's got now. Um, I don't think Charlie Bronson is homophobic. I think he's provocative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and of course, I wish him well. And... Um, Charlie, if you if if you've got a mobile phone and you see this, <laughs> send me a visiting order, and I will come up and see you anywhere you are in this country. <laughs> so, you, you've had a lot of ups and downs in your life, especially with the self harming. Try to take your own life. Were you self harming because was that self medicating? Was that making you kind of feel better? Or why? When did the self harming start? When did you start doing the self harming kind of stuff? Well, I think I started to self-harm probably in my mid-teens. Oh. Um, I wasn't comfortable within my own skin. Um, it wasn't just about um, identifying as as a, a young woman then within this young man's body. It wasn't just about that. It was about the demons that most people have, you know, from their past. Um, sometimes we think we can change our life and forget what has happened to yeah. us, but obviously, certain times it will it will come out. The more you try and the more you try and suppress it. and 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 suppress your feelings, um, 
eventually it will come out in some way. So I would burn myself with a lighter. Um, I would cut with a razor blade. Um, other times the um, the self arm will take um, other forms. So be perhaps uh, alcohol, uh, drug use. Um, I mean, I was on heroin for 15 years, uh, 15 years of my life. And every time I took it, it was almost to the point of death every time. And then also with, uh, in, I ended up in abusive sexual relationships where people would treat me badly. And that was like a form of self-harm for me because I could have pulled away from these relationships. But I kind of felt that... Yeah, that's trauma I, bonding. Yeah. You're used to that, so yeah, you go back I to I had low self-esteem. Yeah. I didn't have much confidence. Um, people are complicated, James. And um, I mean, I'm aware of some of the issues that you've you've raised about your own childhood. And, you know... People, we ain't necessarily good to each other and we're not necessarily good to ourselves on mm -hmm. occasion. Yeah, it's try to value well. But I'm a work in progress, James. Yeah, and you're doing amazing things. We'll touch Thank on that as much. well. So going through all that, in 2017, you were close to death though because you cut off your own testicles. Talk to me about that experience. Well, I prefer to use the term uh, performing a double orchidectomy <laughs> on myself, James, the technical term. I was going to say cut uh, off your balls, but I, I, I try to be professional. Right, that's, James, that's, that's, that's okay, you know. I, you, you know me, um, politically, I'm uh, an anarchist. The anarchist queen of... Uh, of London, uh -huh. I mean, and and I would fight for the right for your mm -hmm. uh, the right for you to say whatever you yeah. want in every in any way you want. I mean, you, you haven't you haven't hurt my feelings. Yeah. I've only got one feeling left, James. <laughs> and that's my feeling of love towards you. So, so how was that? How did that come about then to do that? Because I know you weren't getting your estrogen. Were you, you trying to get estrogen in prison? Well, in two thousand eleven, the prison system. <clears throat> decided that it would bring out this uh, policy, the care and management of transgender prisoners, 2011. Um, uh, a prison service instruction, or as people would know it as a PSI. This was, ideally, uh, it was made up of a, a, a list of um, rules, or, yeah, a list of rules, because they were written in italic, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this policy. However, a lot of prisons decided to interpret it as guidelines, which is not the same as following something to the rule. Now, um, to get on the NHS transgender pathway, where you'll be diagnosed with gender dysphoria, then hopefully prescribed estrogen if you're a trans woman, or if you're a trans man. Uh, be um, diagnosed with gender dysphoria and be prescribed testosterone um, injections. To get that, you first have to have the diagnosis. Now, before you can get the diagnosis, you have to live. Let me do this for the camera. I've always wanted to do this. Mm -hmm. Enroll <laughs> for a minimum of two years, James. Mm -hmm. That means female underwear, female footwear, um, and um, to present to the outside world as a female or as close as you can get within the prison system. Um, you'd have to do that for a minimum of two years before you can even uh, get diagnosed with a gender dysphoria diagnosis. Um, unfortunately, some prisons, especially um, in the early days of my transition within prison, um, they were reluctant to let you have female clothing or makeup to be able to live in raw. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why you did it as well, cut off your testicles? Well, I had been to the clinic um, at Charing Cross, Dr. Barrett. Thank you very much. God bless you. Not many people agree with the decisions that you often make, mm -hmm. but um, I may not necessarily agree with you, but I'm still um, I'm still grateful because Dr. Barrett is um, uh, at Charing Cross. Uh, I think he still works, or he may have retired. 
he, he, he was always kind to me and he always challenged me about the decision I was making and how important uh, it would be and the impact it would have on my life. But I wasn't prescribed, I wasn't given a diagnosis. I was told not only would I have to live in role uh-huh. for a minimum of two years, but I would have to live outside of prison for a minimum of two years and no one was talking about my release and I had I felt this this need to stop my body producing testosterone Mm -hmm. I mean every time I mean where you'd have hair on your face in the morning um, or I'd look at my my testicles I was just I just felt disgusted I just felt disgusted with myself um the, the the muscle mass that I had it, I just hated I hated my body and um I said to the staff and I reached out to them I said to them if you don't help me I will help myself and they just laughed I said to them, I said I will remove my own testicles that's what I'll do and James I am generally a person of my word. If I say or tell you I'm going to do something, I will do it. Because um, I've also been diagnosed with a personality disorder. <laughs> and, one my, yeah, and, one, and one of my risk factors is being impulsive. Mm-hmm. And it was an impulsive decision that I made to take a prison razor blade at two o'clock in the morning and to remove my own testicles. With hindsight, um, I realised how dangerous it was. How sh- <sighs> I'm not going to call my call a decision stupid. Yeah. At that time, it was the most important decision that I had ever life. made. Um, and obviously, when I went to a hospital and they helped tie up the loose odds and ends, kind of thing. Um, apparently, they said I did a really good job. Because <laughs> I Give did, that future. Well, I did actually. I did actually research what, what I was doing. Yeah. Although there was there was a lot of there was a lot of blood loss. Yeah, because you nearly died. Yeah, that's a brave, that's a brave thing to do. But again, with the compulsive, and that just shows you how far you would go to try and make a statement and be who you wanted to be. If you're not, this is why there needs to be a lot more things in place for people who's maybe struggling to come to terms with who they are or what they want to be because it's dangerous because suicide's on the rise and I believe it's there's so many different factors come into that. that well, name. we've had many suicides of transgender people in jail. Officially, um, in the last few years, there was three. There was three cases. But, you know, these are people who openly lived as, as uh, identified as trans women, uh, what it doesn't take into consideration is the amount of people who've committed suicide who haven't come out. So it was just considered an, just a, a basic, uh, a basic suicide, which which is so common uh, now in the prison system that it doesn't even draw attention. In the last prison I was in, we had twenty two suicides um, in Lewis Prison. Um, I was in H um, and Prison Elmley on the Isle of Sheppey in the, the island in the uh, the Thames Estuary. Um, I mean, I was there for seven and a half years. We had 35 suicides after perhaps the first 10. The others didn't, the others didn't even make local press. Yeah. Shameful. See, because you were so openly trans and you, you yeah. were openly, you, you, people knew what you were and what you wanted to be. Yeah. Did a lot of people confide in you then, to confide in you to tell you the secrets are I'm trans not just James it wasn't just prisoners this is staff as well Mm -hmm. because um, discrimination um, against transgender people doesn't just it's it's not just um, it's not just from um, amongst prisoners one uh, one group of prisoners discriminating against another. But staff do it to each other too. There's a lot of bullying amongst prison officers too. And I've met staff who are absolutely afraid that their colleagues will find out that they're um, gay, lesbian, um, transgender or gender non-binary or gender non-conforming or intersex. Um, 
and they hide these secrets and, and you know secrets they can drive you crazy yeah. they can make you really ill um, it's sad but, that it's, but it's, too, but it's yeah. not about my my um, it, it's not about sex and it's not about gender to me and the the, the organisations that I that I represent um, or that I'm a, or allow me to 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 represent them on 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 this platform. It's about freedom. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you've got the prison system is apparently run by professionals. I don't know why I did that, but it felt <laughs> like so doing good. That, no, it you. felt so <laughs> good. Um, I must confess, James. Right. So you've got professional civil servants bullying each other mm -hmm. in no it, it that couldn't happen in uh a majesty's uh inland in revenue you know it couldn't happen in any other um body it couldn't happen in in education because people would come out and defend them people what do you mean but when you've got prison officers who owe us and and i'm not saying all prison officers are like this but People are people, whether they be prison officers or whether they be prisoners. In a male prison system, there is this toxic masculinity. The harder you are, the more people will respect you. So, I mean, prison gyms are full up with people posing. And I'm yeah. sure you've done it yourself, yeah, I James. I do it. And you look great <laughs> from it. <laughs> and rightly so. Um, yeah, but, you'll but, but you understand, you yeah, understand but what I mean. I tend to see the ones who are most violent, more angry, are the... For me now, for my experience, what I've been learning over the last couple of years about the mindset and people I interview, the most loudest and craziest people are the most vulnerable. For me, that's their shield. That's their protection. Well, you're absolutely right, James, but that doesn't give these people the right to demonise uh, and victimise other people. Now, I will... I'll take it on the chin. Um, to mean, the transition from... Not... Uh, not the transition f through gender, but the transition from being a victim to a bully, that comes with in in a, in a happens in a lot of cases, yeah. and it also happened in mine because I started uh, victim uh, victimizing people, and I was a mean motor scooter, James. There ain't no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But I learned a lot of things in prison not just from people who cared about me, um, but also from people I met every day, especially uh, many members of the IRA who were also musicians because I, I mean, I'm a violinist and a guitarist myself. Um, a lot of these um, uh, people in, in the IRA, uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, who took the time to sit down and... and, and and we, we spent a lot of time together anyway. And a lot of these people were musicians or we worked in the same workshops uh, or we were in, we were in um, adjacent cells in segregation units, which was quite often the way. And you spend a lot of time talking about your family, um, where, you had, where you had come from, what your childhood was like, kind of the same discussions that we're having here. Know. And, and they would they would teach me about the lessons that they learned. You know, a lot of people that I met in prison, um, especially um, who were in for terrorism charges. So, I mean, as they grew older and they mellowed out and were less idealistic, um, you know, they... I'm not saying they saw the error of their ways. It's not for me to, to, to know what's in someone else's head, but they try to lead me away from um, the kind of extreme way I was thinking because I was always challenging the prison system. I was always in a segregation unit for year upon year upon year. Um, I spent years in strip cells. Um, I think... Uh, I think Charlie Bronson's got the world record for the amount of time in a segregation unit. But um, how's that good mentally for you, though, being stuck in the room with nothing, just brick walls? It. 
I'm sure you're familiar with um, the um, the spoke prisons mm-hmm. where you'd have the center of the jail where if you walked across it, you'd get a right hander yeah. off the prison staff and all the wings would go off into like spokes. So it'd be like, like ones that were for Pentonville. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I believe that a way a lot, the way that a lot of these cells used to be made was that the window was really high. So you couldn't see trees and all you could do was see the sky from your cell window. And apparently it was designed like that. So the only thing you could think about was what you had done, reflect on your life and reflect on God. So I mean, it was prisons were built in a way to psychologically, uh, affect but it you don't aff- affect the mind mm-hmm. and to break it down but these but you know you you've got organ you've got gels which i do not have any time for like uh grand and underwood and, and they say oh well we, we break people down to build them back up yeah you know now a lot of people will come out of the woodwork and say oh grendon's grendon's fantastic personally i don't believe it i think grendon is a dangerous place mm-hmm. but um that's what I think. So 2007, you became not just an artist, you became an escape artist. You escaped from prison. Uh, no, James, I absconded. Absconded. Escape sounds better. What, well, I, I, had to, I had to climb a really big fence. <laughs> how does that, yeah. how, so what was going through your mind then? Did you not have any release date or did you think, fuck this, this is my opportunity, I'm going to take it? Because you ended up on an aeroplane also, I believe. Yeah. Tell me this light, story. <sighs> I hope there's not much. I, I, I hope I won't have any uh, face any consequences for this, James. I'm 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 not claiming to be a paragon of virtue. Mm-hmm. I'm not claiming to ever be a model prisoner. Um, I was a pain in the ass, James. Still, <laughs> James. That's just a rumor. <laughs> right? Them days are well and truly behind me, James. Um, I have generally been a piss taker in the prison system. If um, if I could get drugs, I would take drugs. If I could get phones, I would get phones. If I could do anything within my power to undermine the prison system and the prison regime as a whole, I would do it. I was the second prisoner to go to the European court for the right for prisoners to vote because I think that's really important. Um, and you know, I could tell you, do you want to know a secret, James? Yes. The most important thing I ever learned from prison was that prison doesn't work. It doesn't. And if it did, I would tell you. You know me enough. Yeah, you yeah, know me yeah, well enough to know that. Honest, yeah. Prison doesn't prison doesn't work. It's a ter- prison is a terrible it, it's so and such anarchic. It's it's so unthinking. It's so we're supposed to be the seventh richest nation no on the planet, mm-hmm. and yet all we can do with. Third, perhaps 33,000, 34,000 people who can't even read or write to, 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 to the same level of a child of 10 years of age. Another perhaps 33, 34,000 people with drug addiction problems. And perhaps another 30, 30 odd thousand people with uh, diagnosed personality disorders or mental illnesses. It's, it's to put them in... A prison system, which is, to, to, I mean, to be kind, is dysfunctional. Mm-hmm. Um, and they think these people are going to get out in a better condition than they went in. Yeah. That is so, it's not very creative. Yeah. That's why, yeah, the, the majority of people go back. Well, the, well, a few nights ago, I was with uh, a friend of mine called uh, Elio. The friend, her name was, and she said to me, she said, uh, well, they said to me, um, I've got two tickets to go and see Joker in Leicester Square. Would you like to come along? 
and at that time I was doing a, I was um, doing a bit of journalism and I was interviewing people, tourists outside of Buckingham Palace, saying, that, um, what do you think of the monarchy? Would you be happy with the monarchy in the country that you come from? And um, personally, I'm, I'm anti-monarchy. I'm a, a Republican. Um, but not like Donald Trump for Republican, yeah, you know. Yeah, I yeah. think, I mean, we should be free uh, free people in Britain, not free citizens speech. of the crown. Yeah, who you I, want to be. That's my view. So anyway, I went along to Leicester Square to the premiere of Joker and I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Anyway, at the end, the director was there and um, he was asking, he said, well, does anybody have any questions? So obviously, me being the show off and the narcissist I am, um, I thought, you know what, this is a golden opportunity. Um, this, is a, this is a platform to put across my my thoughts that um that people within prisons and people outside of prisons who commit crime or have mental health issues um or come from abusive childhoods should not be demonized but they should be they should they should be cared for and they should be nurtured and they should be looked after and they should be seen as victims in their own right rather than criminals, parasites, the people we like to hide away. So I was able to speak to um, the whole audience at this premiere at, mm. at Leicester Square. It was a fantastic opportunity. And thank you for uh, the director of Joker for allowing me that platform. But I said there needs to be more investment in, in mental health You've been to jail yourself. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you know I'm making. You know I'm talking yeah, yeah. sense. But the thing is, this need that the British public have for revenge, it's really inhumane. Yeah, it's, Portugal are leading by example, and always say it. They've dropped their numbers dramatically. They had one percent of people in Portugal addicted to heroin, and those numbers have dropped. Where you've got mm. near enough zero percent people aren't getting re going back to prison also there's a study was done with a man called Bruce Alexander he's a study called Rat Park he had a cage with a rat he had one two water bottles one with heroin one with water the rat would always go to the heroin and eventually it would overdose and die but he also did another study with a rat park he called it, it had like activities for the rats they had the same water bottles one with heroin one with water but they, the rats had had friends there this sounds crazy but search this up it's powerful and also so they had the, the rats had um like the running wheels and like swings none of the rats would go to the heroin they would go just for the normal water at rat park but in the cage themselves 100 percent of them would go to the heroin mm -hmm just like the human beings, because this, the, they say, well, there's never been a study on humans, but if you have, if you look at the Vietnam War, I think there was 20,000, 30,000 people on heroin, 90% of them came back, stopped immediately, because they were in that danger zone, because they were themselves as well, they were scared, the majority went to heroin. So in the rat part one, the rats went to the water, not the heroin. So it shows that if you're outside having fun, surrounded by good people, friends, you tend to not slip into those bad habits, which is a so check this out. I, I might have just butchered that story there, but it's along those lines. Bruce Alexander, powerful man. So, so you're suggesting that, um, and 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 I agree if it's so. So you're suggesting that um, um, the, the the craving, um, the craving for for stimulants, uh, or f or because heroin's a depressant, yeah, isn't it? Or and same as alcohol, it's. Um, um, because some people have said to have addictive personalities, and I think I do. Yeah, but it says that about me as well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Don't, don't tell anybody at all, James. That, but um, but environment plays a big part in uh, yeah. in, in 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 our behaviour. Yeah, and environment, um, the prison environment played a big part in my behaviour, and uh, especially the way I reacted yeah. um, within the prison system. Um, I was seen as dangerous. I was seen as a threat. 
in Whitemore Maximum Security, they said I was the most dangerous person in the prison system. And I could not fathom that out. I said, how can you say that to me? I said, you've got Dennis Nilsson here <laughs> that I used to play Scrabble with. <laughs> I think it was the Scottish, was it the Daily Record or something? Yeah. They did they mm-hmm. did an article about it because he used to keep cheating. He was, he was, I always used to catch him looking for uh-huh. the blanks in the mm-hmm. bag. You know what I mean? I mean, for a person who killed so many people. He, he, how many he, people did he kill? I, th- I think he killed 13 people then chopped them up and stuffed them down the drain shit but the most the, but the most there was nothing amazing out about him you could never pick you would never picked him out in a crowd and i think that was the most shocking thing really but you know i wasn't i wasn't scared of him do you know what i mean did, yeah. um I, this i wasn't scared did you feel it like more ease with the people who were crazier did you feel more connected to them Cra- crazier that's uh, that's all about semantics well, yeah but mm-hmm. with the people who had done the most vicious of crimes did you find it more at ease with them because the people you mentioned because I know you mentioned the boy from Scotland as well earlier um, today when we were speaking who came down to London who he who, gave everybody who, AIDS Darryl, well the story oh Daryl Rowe yeah. yeah what was the story about him Scottish as um, well yeah um this 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 young man in in Scotland. I mean, I I I can't speak for Daryl. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I was with Daryl in in Lewis Prison, um, and it was said that he came to or he he had met men on Tinder, and that he had gave them um, H is it HIV HIV, or yeah, yeah. AIDS or whatever. Apparently, that's what they said. He he mm-hmm. did, of course. Uh, Darren Daryl said that um, it that wasn't so. That there was mm-hmm. there was there was lots of grey areas uh, in the story. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the full story. All I know is perhaps what you mm-hmm. know from reading um, papers, from reading the newspapers. So how have you? But, adap- he, was, but he was always yeah. pleasant to me. How have you adapted then? Because you're just out nearly four months. So how have you adapted to society? Been away from it so long. Because you're doing amazing things, which we'll touch on. But how have you adapted? Amazing. I think amazing. I think you're you're that's a that. I think you're stretching that out. No, you're doing big things, man. You're you're constantly. Out. We'll talk. How are you adapting, though? How are you feeling just now? Um, well, sitting across from me, you must be Jay, feeling fucking great. But how do you feel in in general? James, don't be so nice. <laughs> the world, James. <laughs> listen, you're not. Listen, darling, right? <laughs> you're not in Scotland now. I'm you're, doing you're, your you're, you're, you're in you're in 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 London, which mm-hmm. I would still say is the greatest city in the world mm-hmm. with some of the greatest people. And uh, at the moment, you're in London, so that makes you great too, James. <laughs> well, so, how are you adapting? Are you feeling London. good? Are you feeling good? Um, well, it's everything's um, it's got its ups. Every day has its yeah. ups and downs. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm fortunate that I have some really, I have a really fantastic team of people around mm. to support me. Um, I love my friends. Um, I love the people who've supported me all, all the way through prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one of my oldest friends, um, I mean, visited me almost at least at least once a month for twenty eight years all over Britain. Yeah, fair play, that's a good you know? friend. That then, and my friend now is uh, eighty one years of age, so we often meet up for lunch. But um, I thought, now I'm out of prison. What can I do to give my life some meaning? Um, all the ideas that I had in my head, um, the books that I would read, because when I went to prison, I couldn't read or write. So I pretty much educated myself. And uh, when the opportunity arose, I did my, I'll say my GCSEs and my A-levels, whatever. Um, and this went on to study politics and economics. You've got a degree um, in economics. History. You have a degree in economics, James. I, I, have, I have many qualifications, <laughs> James. But you know what? They're just pieces. They're pieces of paper. The thing is, how can I use uh, the knowledge that I gained um, 
how could I how could I use that? How could I make use of that in the outside world? I wouldn't say they were just pieces of paper because for what you do, because we'll touch on the fact that you're not just an author, but you're a professional violinist, a great artist. And also these the people that you're working with just now, I had to write them down because there's that many. So we've got R W O C. The um, IWOC, yeah. Incarcerated Workers Organising Committee. Yep. You want to run down on who they are? Yes, let's go. They are a fantastic group of people um, across the world, mm-hmm. uh, branches everywhere. Um, in Britain at the moment, there is a prison building program. Now, what apparent, what seems to be happening is that. Um, a lot of taxpayers' money is being used to build prisons. And then apparently the control of these prisons has been handed over to private companies. Now, these private companies are allowing uh, business, big businesses to come in, whether it's um, pe- people like Virgin or B&Q, allowing um, com- uh companies to actually come into prisons and use prison labor on the cheap mm-hmm. um so and and thus undercutting local economies so i mean why would they pay someone minimum wage when they can get a prisoner to do it for 25 quid yeah so i mean exploitation now in the united states where this is which is this is a run-of-the-mill thing. Mm. Prisoners are being exploited, and maybe it's too strong a word to use the word slave labour. But when it comes down to the fact where they say, well, if you don't go and work in this workshop, which is called purposeful activity, you may not get your parole. Mm. You mean you may not um you may not get certain privileges that other prisoners who are working get. So you're actually forced to work for a private company while you're serving your prison sentence. Me, I call that exploitation. Me, I call that wrong. Me, I'll call these fuckers out. Yeah. Now in the United States, a lot of prisoners have started forming unions. They said, well, if I work for a private company, we should be unionized. Mm-hmm. Whether that will ever happen in British jails, I'm not too sure. But uh, wonderful organizations like the IWOC, um, they are they are they are challenging um they are challenging the authorities about their uh, the way they treat prisoners mm-hmm. you've also got um queer care yeah queer care is an absolutely fantastic organization um they if when i go to prisons or um if i need to travel to a prison to deliver um makeup or foundation or clothing uh, because my organisation is the trans, as you know, CEO of uh, the Trans Prisoner Alliance, mm-hmm. um, queer care uh, absorb all the train costs. I mean, the support they've given me is, I mean, they've given me mental, uh, like mental health support, um, any issues that I may have uh, with getting on in the community. Been in, de- trying to help me become less institutionalized. Queer care is 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 yeah. is there for is there for me. They're a fantastic organisation. We'll leave all the links in the description for all these amazing organisations that you're yeah. working for. We've also got the National Prisoner Radio. Oh, um, yeah, National Prison Radio, which is based in um, Brixton, next okay. to Brixton Prison. And what is this for? Um, well. Every so often, I've been invited in to do pretty much what we're doing here, do a podcast. Um, so, and uh, one of the guys there, he was like kind of shadow me, shadowing me around London, mm-hmm. asking me what my views were about uh, the world after 30 years in prison. Um, they were really, um, really supportive and um, especially they did this The Crime and Consequence book for Clinks. Um, they did like the podcast, they did the podcast for that because I, uh, I was given a chapter in the book, uh, Transgender in the 21st Century Prison System, and um, the podcast was recorded by the National uh, Prison Radio. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah. And you've also, you write articles for the Freedom Press? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, Freedom Press is one of the oldest uh, independent 
um, radical publishers of uh, of um, of left wing and, and, and yeah. radical news uh, in the world. Um, it's neither the Guardian or the or or the Times. Um, I think the the writers. Uh, some of the most courageous, uh, some of the greatest and some of the most courageous writing I've seen. Um, if you want to go to like uh, the Freedom uh, Press Bookshop, uh, which is next door to the Whitechapel Gallery up in Allgate East, um, they they have stickers, they have uh, they have uh, books. Uh, they give you insights into history from a slant you may not have heard before. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this. Um, some of it is left wing. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, anarchist uh, publications, which doesn't mean you go around blowing up shit. Yeah, what it means is you're challenging the status quo, and obviously you've got uh, is it 56A Bookshop um, in South London? I mean, between um, I mean in London, these are places that I go to if I want to know about uh, British history. Um, if I want to do research on um, on government policies regarding transgender prisoners, and um, of course they're fantastic places to network with mm-hmm. some of the greatest, the kindest, and the coolest minds in London yeah. at this moment. It's great to see that you're involved with a lot of good people then people as willing to support you that must be good for you so plans for the future then moving forward what's your plans because I know you want to be in the political party I want you, you want to be a politician you want to be sitting at a big James, table that's supposed to be a fucking secret it's not now no <laughs> we'll now. edit that out then well we'll edit that out well what we'll edit that I, out well don't talk no no it. that's no that's okay go for it sure? yeah I told you James I mean no yeah, kid gloves with me I don't want any no well th- there's an organisation that I really care about that I support called CAPE, the Campaign Against Prison Expansion. Now, at the moment, I think that young black men, young Muslim men, women with mental health issues and obviously Men. White males with mental health issues, the poor, the vulnerable. Not just I'm not just blaming the Tories for this, but the default setting has been that if you do not conform, if there is no spaces for you in psychiatric units because the units has been sold off, so the lands can be gentrificated and have big buildings on it for profit the default setting is for people like that is prison prison the default setting for hiding away our social problems James it's unethical and it's immoral and every the thing is everybody knows this I mean, you know this. I know. I mean, I know that you know that. The governments know this, but they're not willing to share. Jeremy Corbyn was absolutely right. Now, I, 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 I love Jeremy. I mean, I, I, I love him, and I know he's a pain in the ass. I know a lot of people are suspicious of him. A lot of people think he's anti-Semitic. Bollocks! At the last general election, he was demonised. But he was right. Um, there's, there are many things that we don't agree on. But what he was right about was this. We're not a poor country. We're not impoverished. This country is not on its ass. There are enough resources for everybody. But people have to share you know, I thought one of the first lessons that most parents teach their children is to share. Now, Boris Johnson, for all his faults, 
I mean, I call him the Don Quixote of the 21st century. <laughs> and if you've read Don Quixote, you know exactly <laughs> what I mean. Um, for all Boris Johnson's faults, him and his team, they pulled a masterstroke. I mean, and that was to divide working class communities. And they did that. And they, they encouraged and they fermented this idea in the minds of many working class people in Britain that all of their ills, all of their woes and all of their problems were down to immigration. Mm -hmm. James, you're an immigrant in my city. When I come to Glasgow... I'd be an immigrant in yours. This building that we're sitting in, this microphone, this lead, and my glasses, these are probably all made by immigrants. I mean, immigrants built Great Britain. What do you think the state of freedom of speech is there now? Do you think it's getting a took away from the people? Can you expand on that please. yeah I just think if somebody's willing to speak out about something nobody's allowed opinions anymore without getting called out or getting called a racist or a Nazi or that's right or wrong you can't just sit and have a normal discussion with someone and two people disagreeing but sitting civilly and do you feel as if when people are speaking out that that people's getting their words twisted where people are too scared to talk about certain subjects now because they're scared of the backlash do you mean in the private arena or in the public arena? I just mean in both, in general. James, the circles that I mix in, I, I say the wrong things. I make, um, on a regular occurrence, I make social faux pas. And I acknowledge that. I acknowledge that I may be... Uh, my mouth was working faster than my brain. There's nothing wrong with being sensitive and with being kind and being respectful of, and and having good manners. There's nothing wrong with that. And that is, that is a thing that we should all encourage amongst each other. If you've, if you've got an idea in your head or if you have a view and you know, it's going to hurt someone else. Well, if you've got nothing worth saying, you know it, say fuck all. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean? But if you do, mm-hmm. don't be don't don't be a coward. Don't 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 be a whiner. Mm-hmm. Don't say oh or don't say nothing because because everybody will, will will shoot me down. Well when you say something, you you, you there are there are consequences. There are consequences to what we do with our hands and there are consequences to what we say. Now I misgender people, um, not often, but I do. Mm-hmm. But because I do that, it doesn't, um, the people that have around me are forgiving it. And I say, look, sometimes I just don't think. I mean, getting the pronouns uh, uh, wrong, especially with uh, a lot of my friends who identify as gender non-binary. Mm-hmm. Um, and for that, I'm, 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 I am, sorry and 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 they know that and they are forgiving and um they encourage me to think to think more about other people and maybe to slow to slow my mouth down a bit yeah but it's good i think i think i think maybe you can take some lessons from my (laughs) friends james (laughs) fuck that we just shoot i just leave no podcast yeah Yeah, we'll just be sitting in silence yeah sarah Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure is there anything you would like to finish up on? Um, I think for this moment, I've said all I've got to say. And um, I'd like to thank... Um, Me, the, the, no, <laughs> I'm not going to... I mean, I don't know who's... Uh, <laughs> maybe you should have got a bigger room to uh, film this podcast because our two egos in the same room... It's just too big. <laughs> no, I'll take, like I say, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank mm. um, my friends at Queer Care. Uh, obviously, the Campaign Against Prison Expansion, Incarcerated Workers Organising Committee, and um, the prisoner. Oh my, oh my word. You should have brought that up. Um, the Prisoner Solidarity yeah. Network. Mm-hmm. So we do... Um, 
we write to transgender prisoners whose families perhaps have deserted them. Um, we're about the abolishment of uh, the IPP sentence, and I'm sure you know about that yeah. issue already. Um, anyone can go online and read about the IPPs, where some people have been given like a, been told, oh, you you have to do a minimum of two years, and they're still in 14 years later. Mm -hmm. Imagine you're a parent or a child, and your family, and your and your dad, your bro brother, your mum mm -hmm. or your cousin's been told, yeah, you've got to do two years, and then 14 years later, you're still in there. Mm -hmm. It's fucking, it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's in your mind, and it yeah. and it and it is wrong. Um, so people like. Uh, like the uh, Prisoner uh, Solidarity Network, like I said, we write and we mm -hmm. support prisoners who are in jail. Um, if they need uh, legal help, if they if they need um, psychiatric reports uh, to challenge um, unfavourable ones made by prison mm -hmm. psych uh, or psychiatrists employed yeah. by the prison system, um, we try to do that. And Does it get queer? Care Queer Britain. We've also got Ava Radio. Oh, Ava Radio. We'll leave all the okay. links in this in the description. No, but Queer Britain, they're exhibiting yeah. Prisonopoly, which mm -hmm. um, the piece of art that mm -hmm. I, I made, they're exhibiting that um, as part of the Queer Britain exhibition, which is being run by um, the fantastic and gorgeous Good. Joseph Galliano. We'll leave all the links in the description. Before we finish up, for anybody that's maybe want to come forward and speak to you or maybe because you're honest about everything. Yeah. So for anybody that's maybe needing any help, how can they contact you through your social media? If you put Sarah Jane Baker, if, 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 can I yeah. you indulge me a moment? Yeah. This is my favorite thing to do. This feeds my narcissism. You should do, <laughs> it. You should do this more often. Right. So if I click this, this is the first mobile phone I've ever had outside of a prison. Right, so if I click on here and go, hey Google, is that right? Feed my narcissism. Come on, Samsung Galaxy. Hey Google. What the fuck are you want? Oh, if you've, uh, at, you know, someone showed me some of these things where, yeah. you, where you can say things uh -huh. to it and it just uh, pops just up. Ones. Well, anyway. If you just say, hey, Google, hey, Google. What did it say? Get. <laughs> well, I normally say to her, hey, Google, who is Sarah Jane Baker? Mm -hmm. And it will tell you who I am. It will tell you that I'm the CEO of the Trans Prisoner Alliance that I hope mm -hmm. everybody will support. Get involved, get behind I mean, them, yeah, yeah. Trans and also, we're trying to raise, we're, you're trying to raise money as well, because now you're basically... You can go away now. <laughs> because you're trying to get a flat because basically you're homeless just now as well. Yeah, well, you I've been told that my time in the hostel is up and that I shouldn't use the hostel to hide in. This is time for yeah. me to move on. Um, obviously, I need to live in an area which I consider safe, mm -hmm. that there is some security and that I can run my, organis uh, my organization from. Because I say there are... Um, I believe about 2,000 transgender prisoners, 140 approximately living openly. I believe nobody should have to live in fear, whether you're in prison or whether you're outside. And I will do everything within my power to ensure that transgender prisoners in jail, which are one of the most marginalised mm -hmm. sections of, of, of Britain at the moment, um, there's not many people... Um, who's, who are going to bat or are supporting trans yeah. uh, prisoners or identify as transgender, yeah. whether they be trans men or trans women, or mm. indeed anybody, uh, LGBTQI yeah. or, I mean, anybody. We, I mean, the Prison Solidarity Network and Queer Care and the Trans Prisoner Alliance, I mean, mm -hmm. or, or, or the, indeed uh, uh, IWOC or yeah. CAPE, I mean, we support prisoners. We support, we support everybody. Mm -hmm. And we will leave all the links in the description, including try to help Sarah get her apartment so she can live um, safe and he keep doing what she's doing to help others who need your help, basically. But listen, it's been an absolute pleasure, my James, love. Um, it's likewise. God bless. And I thank really you very much for it. this opportunity. Yeah, likewise. And, um, and, and thank you very much to all the people out there who've supported me since my release. I love you all, and I value the support that you've given me. Thank you, Thank my you love. Much. I appreciate it. And the great it. British public too. Yeah.
more of the Scottish though. <laughs> Thank you.